Hello aviation fans, Sky here, and the near future will be the time of the firsts. I already made a video about the first American jetliner as a part of the Boeing Marathon, and I'm preparing a video about the first Soviet jetliner. But in the process I thought it would be fitting to make a video about the first jet airliner in the world. Yes, it may be a surprise for the Patriots from both sides of the Cold War, but a decade after the end of the World War II, not the USA nor the USSR were the leaders of the jet age. In those glorious times, both of them were falling behind the tribesmen of Sherlock Holmes and James Bond. The Haviland DH-106 Comet is a four-engine passenger jet airliner developed by the British de Havilland Company in the late 1940s, the world's first representative of this breed of large birds. The history of this aircraft began back in 1943, while the Soviet army was fighting the Nazis in Stalingrad and the American troops were sharing tropical beaches with the armies of the Japanese Empire, the Cabinet of the United Kingdom formed a special committee in order to figure out what the world aviation will look like after this nightmare ends. One of the recommendations of this committee was the creation of an aircraft capable of crossing the Atlantic, carrying about a ton of cargo or passengers, and flying at speeds of about 400 miles per hour, 640 kilometers per hour. The first two goals are understandable, but with the third one there were questions. 400 miles per hour? For a civilian aircraft, it was very fast. For example, the newest Lockheed Constellation, the flagship of the civilian aviation and a real marvel for that time, had a cruise speed of about 340 miles per hour, and this figure for such a plane was considered almost the limit of dreams. And then the respectable gentleman just added a few dozen more. It was obvious that piston engines would not be able to give such a cruise speed to a large aircraft, but naturally the hints were made towards another technology. De Havilland understood this hints and began work on an airplane equipped with a jet engine based power plant. Yes, now jet engines are a usual thing in aviation, but that's now. In the 1940s they were terribly unreliable, had a flying resource driving towards zero and consumed crazy amounts of fuel. This technology barely appeared in the military aviation and the civilian jetliner seemed to be a promising bright but distant future. So the community's opinion was simple. If you claim that you want to create almost a medium-range airliner equipped with jet engines in the 1940s, I look at you with an expression of exhaustion and ever so slight amusement. <laughs> Nevertheless, the project, which received an index Type 106, was officially initiated in early 1945. Let them work, we'll see if anything comes out of it. The first problem of the jet plane project was the fact that there was no jet engine for it. Initially planned Helford H1 Goblin engine was not powerful enough, and it was suggested to replace it with the new Rolls-Royce Avon. However, these beautiful and promising engines were too complicated, and the deadlines for completing their modifications and tests went somewhere beyond the horizon. As a result, the aircraft received the newest Helford H2 Ghost. Yeah, the British never had problems naming their products. Despite the apparent success in the engines department, in the beginning the requirements still had to be lowered significantly. It was planned to create a small plane for regional routes, accommodating only 6 people. Later, the aircraft size increased and the capacity rose to 24 people. Financial risks were constantly growing, but soon the aircraft became interesting for customers. The British Overseas Airways Corporation, or the BOAC, decided to place an order for a couple dozen planes. Type 106 continued to change during the development. In 1946, BOAC demanded that the capacity had to increase to 36 seats. The further increase in the aircraft size and its complication led to the Havilland abandoning a number of innovations. The aircraft was to receive a minimum swept wing and a classic tail, not too different from the ones on the conventional airliners. The fuselage became much larger than the original version. It had to accommodate 36 passengers in four chairs in a row with one aisle. In December 1947, Type 106 received the official name DH-106 Comet. DH-106 was a new type of aircraft. The testing and certification program for it was more intense and complicated. In the period from 1947 to 1948, active research was carried out, including the work to increase the resource of the airframe. 
As practice had shown, the extended studies and tests were not sufficiently extended. The first prototype was assembled in 1949 and in July made its maiden flight. That was six years before the appearance of the first Soviet jetliner and almost a decade before the American. After the first flight, the demonstration of this plane at Farnborough was a great success for the airshow. Let's look at the comet closer. The DH-106 comet is an all-metal monoplane with a low wing. In general, nothing supernatural, although the aircraft looks quite unusual. Power plant? 4 de Havilland Ghost turbojet engines. Yes, yes, in the beginning it was the Halford engines, but during the work de Havilland bought Halford. And yes, when Rolls-Royce Avon engines were finally realized, they were applied to the Comet Model 2. The engines were placed in pairs and were buried in the root of the wing near the center wing box. This arrangement made it possible to protect the engines from the outside damage and simplify maintenance, although it complicated the structure and made the airframe a bit heavier. The design even provided some armored elements, which were supposed to prevent the destruction of the wing in case the engine suddenly explodes. The fuselage of the aircraft was very large for a jet plane of that time. Its size was close to the first generation Boeing 737. At the same time, the capacity of the first aircraft was only 36 people. The reason for this was the extreme devotion of the Havilland and BOAC to increase comfort in flight. The plane was packed with vibration and noise-absorbing elements. The capacity had suffered, but the work had its results. In terms of comfort, the Comet was something unreal for that time. The crew of the aircraft most often consisted of four people, two pilots, a flight engineer and a navigator. Avionics had many systems close to the Lockheed Constellation, however the Havilland developed a number of completely new systems that were later actively licensed and used on American and French first-generation jetliners. The first series production plane took off in 1951 and was transferred to the special BOAC flight unit created for the Comets. In September 1951, the Havilland Comet officially started operations. By the middle of the year 1953, flights on these planes became a real hit, especially after the royal family members rode one of the planes. The new jet airliners provided passengers with an extraordinary level of comfort in flight at a cruising speed of 460 miles per hour, 740 kilometers per hour. An incredible figure for a passenger aircraft. By that time, BOAC had developed a special long-range route from London to Tokyo. The journey involved nine intermediate landings and took about 36 hours. Previously, a similar flight used Argonaut piston aircraft and the journey lasted 86 hours, which is more than three days. So don't complain on the modern 10-hour flights. Compared to your grandparents, you're in the awesome bright future. Oh, and another bonus. A high-speed jet aircraft flew at an altitude of about 42,000 feet or 13 kilometers. Due to this performance, the Comet could fly above storms, while the piston planes had to fly around them or wait. So 86 hours were the shortest time, if the weather was good. This bonus was appreciated. In a short time, the number of long-distance routes increased. Soon the Havilland had reached the peak of its success. Comet 1 and Comet 1A began to be exported to France, and the upgraded versions went to India and Japan. The purchase contracts were being signed by airlines from Brazil and the US, including Pan American, that got tired of waiting for Boeing and Douglas to develop their models. In addition, the Comet 3, created by that time, already accommodated 76 passengers, and having a range of about 2300 miles, 4300 kilometers, could fly across the Atlantic. The de Havilland Comet became a real revolution and pride of the United Kingdom. Even the US and the USSR were lagging behind at least a few years. However, like all revolutions, this one had its victims. In 1952 and 1953, two comets of the BOAC and Canadian Pacific Airlines were unable to take off, rolled out of the runway and collapsed. Several people died. Investigation showed that the pilots, accustomed to piston aircraft, lifted their planes too actively, losing thrust and speed. After the introduction of a number of adjustments to the operational rules, as well as the upgraded slats, this problem was solved. Everything seemed well, but soon, in the same 1953, there was a new plane crash. During the flight through the storm after departure from Calcutta, the BOAC airliner collapsed in air. 43 people were killed. 
Only eight months later, in 1955, another BOAC airliner took off from Rome, set the course for London and disappeared. The airline decided to stop the flights of this aircraft. De Havilland came to a conclusion that the disaster occurred because of the engine explosion. They conducted a check of the power plants and reinforced the structure around them. Despite this, the confidence in the aircraft remained and other airlines continued their operation. But all that changed only a few months later, when the comet of South African Airways, which flew from Rome to Cairo on its way to Johannesburg, fell into the sea not far from Naples. After this, all aircraft of the model DH-106 were forbidden to fly. The type certificate was temporarily withdrawn and the production line of de Havilland stopped. The Prime Minister Winston Churchill demanded a wide investigation of these disasters and an unprecedented work began under the direct control of the Parliament. The investigation that lasted several years showed that the air crashes were caused by the flaws of the fuselage structure. At that time, large amounts of drilling, as well as the square windows, were a common practice. But it was usual for the ordinary aircraft. The turbojet comets flew faster and higher, and the airframe, especially the fuselage, was subject to heavy strains and pressure drops. Studies have shown that the usual methods of assembly led to the appearance of microfractures and increased the effect of metal fatigue. As a result, the damage was spreading exponentially, which ultimately led to explosive decompression and the destruction of the aircraft. De Havilland launched a large-scale work to create a new version of the aircraft, which should no longer have been subject for those risks. The square windows were replaced with oval ones, and the defective zones of the fuselage were reinforced. But despite all the efforts, most of the already produced aircraft did not fly again. Operation of the Comets remained banned until 1958. Based on the Comet 3 model, the newest and most advanced Comet 4 was created. It became the new generation, more efficient, more spacious and economical, and with safety sufficient for customers to pay attention to it again, by signing contracts for several dozens of units. The Comet 4 made the first flight in the spring of 1958, and by September received a type certificate. However, time and reputation were lost. A series of disasters and the scandals that accompanied them were not forgotten. People had their minds set, comets kill. Airlines were afraid to buy the plane, and passengers were afraid to fly on it. In addition, by the end of the 1950s, the British monopoly in the world of jet passenger aviation ended. The Soviets made their Tupolev 104, France introduced South Aviation Caravel, and in the US, Boeing 707 and Douglas DC-8 started operations. These planes appeared later and, using de Havilland's experience, were superior to the Pioneer in many ways. In total, 76 Comet 4 airliners were delivered, against hundreds of units from competing companies. Plans to create an improved version Comet 5 did not find support from the government and airlines. The plane was never created. In 1964, the production was closed. The world saw 114 aircraft of this model. In the 1960s, British airlines began replacing their Comet fleet with new planes, especially on transatlantic flights. In addition to the purchased American airliners, British second-generation jet aircraft, such as the Vickers VC-10, came to the play. Two Comet C4 airliners were later returned to the Havilland, and after the reorganization of the company and the creation of Hawker Siddeley, were rebuilt into prototypes of Hawker Siddeley Nimrod C patrol aircraft. They confirmed the reliability of the fourth Comet. Nimrod left the Royal Navy only in 2011. The operation of the civilian Comets was officially completed in 1997, with the final flight of the Comet 4C, which was used as a flying laboratory. Well, what else can I say? Despite all the problems and disasters associated with the Comet, these airliners are considered an absolute revolution in the aviation industry, which accelerated the development of global air transportation. Besides, this plane, that was ahead of its time, faced serious difficulties, but the experience of its operation allowed the aircraft manufacturers of the UK and other countries to avoid them in the future. In a sense, the Comets took the strike of the risks of the jet age, and if they didn't crash from the mistakes they made, then probably the Tupolevs, Boeings, Douglases and other airliners would have crashed from the same mistakes later. This is it for today. Don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel. Fast flights and soft landings to you.